Hi, my name is Sergey Levin, and I'm going to talk about understanding the world through action. Let's start with a very kind of big picture view of self-supervised learning. In order to make deep learning models work really well, we basically need two things. We need a very large model, and we basically know how to solve that. We solve that by building a giant data center and spending lots of cash. So uh, while there may be more elegant solutions, this one seems to be you know, good enough if you've got the resources for it. But second, uh, we need a large data set. And not just any data set. For classic supervised deep learning, we need a large labeled data set. And collecting such data sets is typically a very labor intensive process, uh, both curating the data itself and of course also labeling it. So the big idea with self-supervised learning is that perhaps instead of spending all that manual effort at curating large data sets, we could take our big models and utilize small labeled data sets and then a giant unlabeled kind of garbage data set, which we can get just from the internet, sort of just harvesting everything we can get our hands on. And if we can get this to work, then uh, we can have existing deep learning techniques uh, require less manual effort and data collection and potentially use even more data and get even more performance than we could with the largest labeled data set that we can get our hands on. And self-supervised learning is basically the part that's supposed to process this giant unlabeled garbage data set without requiring lots of manual effort. Okay, so uh, if that's the big idea, then we need to ask this question. When we use self-supervised learning, where does the knowledge come from? So we've got this big garbage data set. What is the useful knowledge we can distill out of it? Uh, the classic unsupervised learning answer is that we estimate the density P of X. So the data set consists of some samples and we're going to estimate the distribution that generated those samples. This is quite nice because it's a purely data-driven process. It sort of comes from first principles um, and you can write lots of math about it. So it's a very good way to generate uh, a very large number of papers. But ultimately it's somewhat limited because we're just learning from whoever collected the data. So we'd like to hope that estimating P of X is really about learning how the world works, but to a very large extent, it's about learning how the data was generated. And if we're talking about kind of uh, you know, arbitrary random garbage data, well, it was whoever uh, decided to collect that data in the first place. So if these are photographs from Flickr, we're really learning to a large extent about what kinds of things people choose to photograph on Flickr, which is not quite the same as this kind of garbage uh, get your hands on in all data you can uh, find perspective because, well, <laughs> if you end up using garbage data, you end up learning the distribution of the garbage heap. Okay, uh, I should clar qualify this with a caveat. This is a little bit of a pessimistic view because in reality, even garbage data has structure uh, and in principle, such an unsupervised learning method could figure out that structure in addition to whatever biases are in the data from whoever collected it. But perhaps there's a reason that the most successful self-supervised methods actually don't do this. While we've seen tremendous advances in unsupervised learning and generative modeling, uh, these are not the methods that are learning the most useful representations. And it's not because it's difficult to learn generative models of everything in the world. Like the current generative models trained on huge data sets are actually very good at generation. They're just not necessarily that great at representation learning. So then we have the alternative, which is sort of the, the hip, trendy, modern self-supervised learning perspective illustrated here with a hip and trendy uh, animation from the Google AI blog. Uh, and where do these methods get their knowledge? So the, we're talking about things like contrastive learning. Well, to a large extent, they actually get their knowledge out of the data augmentation. So in this little animation, you can see that an image comes in, uh, different augmented views of that image are generated, and then the model is more or less trained so that it represents different augmented views of the same image with similar features. So in a sense, this kind of modern, hip, trendy, self-supervised learning perspective is really about learning from data augmentation. And this works really well. Uh, and there's much less math, so it's, it ends up being easier to use. But the criticism I would have for this is that it's to a large extent really learning from smart researchers who design data augmentation rules. So the knowledge uh, has to be put in there by the designer before the self-supervised learning method can really extract it. And you hope that you could do better than that. Um, so you don't need uh, people taking photographs to, to be your source of knowledge anymore. Uh, but you do need some human designer. Okay, so if we want to think of a more principled way to do self-supervised learning, we can step back a bit and ask, well, why do we need machine learning anyway? Right? Like, before we can determine what, what's a good way to do self-supervised learning, 
we need to determine what, what is it for? What is it for in the end? Um, and to give us a hint for what the answer to this question might be, we can ask an even more basic question. Why do we need brains anyway? These things. Uh, we can ask um, a fellow named Daniel Walpert. He is a world expert in why we need brains. He's a, a well-known uh, British neuroscientist, and he knows quite a lot about brains. And here's what Daniel Walpert has to say. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only. That's to produce adaptable and complex movements. Movement is the only way we have for affecting the world around us. I believe that to understand movement is to understand the whole brain. Now, it won't surprise you to know that Daniel Walpert works on the neuroscience of motor control, but I think there's a fairly deep point here, and I think we, we can formulate a kind of a postulate applying the same lesson to machine learning, that we need machine learning for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex decisions. Now, I want to zoom in on this postulate a little bit and hopefully try to convince you that at some level this is basically true. Uh, now, it's very clearly true in some scenarios. For instance, if you're using machine learning to control a robot, which is something that I work on, then it's clear your goal is to make decisions like, how do I move my joints? If you're using machine learning to control an autonomous car, then you're making decisions, how do I steer the car? But now, at this point, you might say, well, hang on, uh, but I work on image recognition. I work on natural language processing. What is the decision in that case? Maybe it's the image label? Well, I would say the answer is usually no. Um, the thing is, whenever we do any kind of uh, machine learning for perception, for classification problems, things like that, we should really be asking what happens with a label afterwards. The decision is not the label that you output. It's not the translated sentence that your machine translation system outputs. Um, it's what it's actually used for in the end. Is it used to tag a user's photo? Is it used to detect an endangered animal in a camera trap? Um, these are decisions. Uh, and these decisions lead to consequences. And an effective machine learning system should be able to understand the meaning of those decisions and their consequences and prioritize its uh, representation, its mistakes, and uh, what it chooses to spend more time on effectively so as to produce the consequences that you want, the outcomes that you want. So if we accept this perspective for a second, we could ask, well, how do we devise a self-supervised learning framework centered around making decisions, because that's ultimately what machine learning is for, it's for making those decisions. The basic principle uh, that I'm going to argue for is, if we want our models to make decisions, we should pre-train them to make decisions. So what's a decision? Well, here's a potentially gratuitous way that we can define it. We can say that we have some kind of state that I'm going to call xt, and that's the present. So that could be a state in the RL sense, or it could be an image, or it could be something else. And we have xt plus k, which is the future, something that will take place sometime from now. And don't worry about what k is. It doesn't have to be a constant. It could be at any point in the future. And we'll call this an outcome. And then we have something that we choose, something that you pick. And that's at, that's your action. So it's whatever your model outputs that's going to affect the future. And you can say that informally your decision is a distribution over actions given the present and the future that you want to reach. So what action should you take now, given, we're, given the present and given the desired future? And if you can produce these actions, actions that lead to a particular desired outcome, then you've learned something about making decisions. You've learned something about uh, choosing actions that lead to outcomes. So here is an idea for a self-supervised learning objective. What if we learn how to make uh, decisions, how to take actions, to produce any possible outcome? If the point of machine learning is to make decisions, this seems like a great pre-training strategy. Uh, now, as a brief aside, did I, just, did I just make all this up? Well, sort of, but there is a more principled perspective, and I'll return to this later in the talk. Uh, we could think of decision-making as maximizing mutual information between the choices that you make, which I'm going to denote with Z here, because in, you know, they, they could be uh, not just immediate actions, but kind of longer-term primitives the mutual information between whatever choice you make z and the future outcomes xt plus k given the present xt. So z is some kind of command which could be an action or it could be something else. If you're maximizing the mutual information between your commands and future outcomes, um, this has some really interesting properties. Uh, and if you want to read more about these you can check out these papers, but the short version is that uh, you could actually show that maximizing mutual information between your command, whether it's a goal, task, or an action, and future outcomes is the best thing to do to prepare yourself for any task that you'd be given in the future uh, under some assumptions about 
the set of those tasks. So there's actually some principles, which I won't have time to go into in this talk, why uh, learning to achieve any outcome is actually a, a, an optimal way to pre-train in certain circumstances. Okay, so that leaves us with this uh, maybe slightly uh, grandiose statement, ask not what self-supervised learning can do for RL, but what RL can do for self-supervised learning because RL is the mechanism by which we learn to achieve outcomes. So uh, learning to uh, achieve any outcome is a goal conditioned or task conditioned or something conditioned reinforcement learning problem. So the corresponding view of self-supervised learning is that you're going to have your small task specific data set and you're going to have your uh, giant unlabeled garbage dump and you're going to use that giant unlabeled garbage dump uh, in a self-supervised goal conditioned or task conditioned RL learning loop where this agent is going to uh, attempt to achieve any possible outcome in this uh, uh, garbage dump to acquire good representations that are well suited for at attaining any outcome that could be desirable for a downstream task. So this is great because this allows us to learn about how the world actually works. It doesn't involve estimating data density, so uh, the nature of that garbage dump is less important. It's really about uh, the agent uh, practicing it on its own. And we're not relying on any data augmentation, so this is really learning uh, from the real world rather than from human ingenuity. But it's, of course, not so simple. So classic RL methods are on policy algorithms, which means that you have an algorithm that needs to interact with the world, collect some experience, improve its policy, interact with the world some more, and repeat this process, which means that you, I guess, kind of have to have like a robot playing around in the garbage dump and learning stuff about it. Um, so with naive RL, this is a costly interactive process of done in the real world, which sort of defeats the main point of self-supervised learning, which is to allow us to use cheap data that we already have lying around. Right? The point of self-supervised learning is not to expend huge amounts of effort to collect the perfect data, it's to use data we've already got to get the best model we possibly can so that we can then learn downstream tasks efficiently. So what we can do instead is uh, use goal-conditioned reinforcement learning for our self-supervised learning procedure, but instead of doing online RL, we can do offline RL. So offline RL is a, a type of reinforcement learning that learns from data that has already been collected without active interaction. So we would basically cut out this part of the branch. And now this looks much more appealing as a self-supervised learning procedure because we could take data that we already have, uh, as much data as we can get our hands on, and then use offline RL to essentially ask, how can you accomplish any possible outcome in this data set? And you don't have to actually succeed at accomplishing those outcomes. You're just using this to learn good representations for downstream behavior. So let's learn to make all possible decisions using offline RL from plentiful data that we've already collected and then use this as universal pre-training that will help us make other task-directed decisions for any downstream task. So then to kind of summarize the recipe, you have a large data set of diverse but possibly low quality behavior. Uh, so not a literal gar garbage dump, but like everything that uh, you've seen before, maybe uh, some of it is videos of humans, some of it is robots doing stuff, autonomous cars driving around, whatever you can get your hands on and whatever is sort of appropriate for your domain. Uh, then you're going to run self-supervised reinforcement learning. And there are a few choices here, like you could run goal-conditioned RL, uh, you could do some sort of self-supervised skill discovery. Um, there are other choices too, so we'll talk about some of those. And then once you've completed that, then you can use this as a starting point for downstream tasks. Uh, and I'll discuss examples where these downstream tasks are RL tasks, but that's not necessarily the case because uh, remember that we need machine learning for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex decisions. So even tasks that look more like classification tasks or perception tasks can in fact be formulated as decision-making tasks with an appropriate choice of action representation. So in all the projects I'll discuss, they are actually RL tasks, specifically robotics tasks, because I work on robotics. But I think a lot of these ideas could be extended uh, quite readily to non-robotics domains as well. Okay, so here are the particular projects that I'll discuss in this talk. Uh, I'll first talk about the foundations of offline RL algorithms so that we have the algorithmic basis for what comes next. Uh, then I'll talk about self-supervised offline RL with goal conditioning and discuss some large-scale experiments we've done in this direction uh, at Google. Uh, and then I'll uh, talk about something a little more forward-looking, specifically online fine-tuning with self-supervised RL, and I'll discuss how 
in interactive settings, you could have an agent that actually performs offline self-supervised learning, then some additional online exploration in a new domain, and then actually performs desired tasks, even in zero shot. But let's start with the algorithmic foundations. So first, a, a really quick primer uh, to the basics of RL. So in reinforcement learning, you have an agent that interacts with the world by selecting actions, which I'm going to note as A, and the world responds with states S and rewards R. And the goal of the agent is to construct a policy pi, which selects the appropriate action in each state. Uh, the RL objective is to maximize the total expected reward for the agent. And a very useful object for doing this is something called the Q function. So the Q function tells you if you start in a particular state, then take a particular action, and then follow the policy pi, what is the total reward that you will accumulate? Uh, and the uh, way that you can improve your policy if you have a Q function for a policy pi is to take an action with probability one uh, if it's the argmax of the Q function and zero otherwise. And this will always improve the policy. You could also cut out the middleman and just learn the optimal Q function directly by minimizing the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. And this is actually, this can be derived by combining um, the policy duration with the uh, with a Q function recursion. So the max here basically comes from the R max. So if you can make the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation equal at all state action tuples, then you will recover the Q function for the optimal policy. And from that, you can then recover the optimal policy itself. So all you really have to do is enforce this equation at all states. Uh, and typically the way we do it is we subtract the right-hand side from the left-hand side and minimize the squared difference. So it becomes basically a regression problem. The crucial thing about this procedure, which is at the heart of Q-learning, is that we don't need the S, A, S prime tuples to be collected from any particular policy. In principle, if you have enough of them and you can enforce this equation such that it's basically true at all states through generalization, then you will recover the optimal policy regardless of which policy was used to collect that data in the first place. At least in principle, that's the idea. So it's very tempting to think, well, maybe this can be the basis for an offline reinforcement learning procedure. When we tried this uh, a few years back, it worked very poorly. Uh, so here what you see is an experiment using an actor critic algorithm, but it's basically similar in design to the Q-learning algorithm on the previous slide, on the half cheetah benchmark using offline data. And the different colored lines show data sets of different sizes. So blue is 1,000, red is 1 million. A good reward on this task is about 10,000. And you can see that all of these methods are hovering around minus 250, so they all do very poorly. If we ask them how well they think they're doing, they actually think they're doing great. So, so this is, the y-axis here is actually a log scale. Um, so they think that they're gonna get roughly 10 to the seventh power or more in reward, but they actually get much, much less. So why is that? The Q function is convinced it'll do great, but it actually does terribly. Well, to understand why this would happen, we can rewrite the Q function in a slightly different form shown here. Instead of writing it as a max, over the target value, we're gonna write it as an expectation under some new policy pi nu, where pi nu is given by the argmax. Uh, this equation is exactly equivalent. It's just by writing it as an expectation under this argmax policy, it makes it a little bit more explicit that in order for Q-learning to work, you need to be very good at computing expected values under this pi nu. Now, this is unfortunately a very good way to find adversarial actions because pi nu is ex explicitly optimized so that it produces large Q values. And we know that if we optimize the input into a neural net so that that neural net produces the desired value, we can basically fool a neural network into producing any value we want. So when you use offline data and you run Q learning or actor critic, you're essentially asking your actor to produce adversarial examples that fool your Q function into thinking it'll get a high value. And that's of course exactly why that uh, plot on the right has these enormous estimated values, the Q function is being fooled very efficiently uh, to produce large values. And this can happen, of course, even if the fit of the Q function is very good. So let's say that the green curve is the true Q function, the blue is the fit. It's very accurate in most places, but of course, if we maximize it, we'll pick exactly the point with the largest error in the positive direction, this one. Okay, so how can we address this? Well, one very simple idea uh, which is the basis of a very effective algorithm called conservative Q-learning, is to directly regularize out these erroneous uh, maxima. So what we can do is we can take our regular objective, minimizing the difference between the left-hand and right-hand side of the Bellman equation, 
and augmented with a regularizer that explicitly tries to find actions with large Q values, that's what mu is doing, and then minimize them. So here we're minimizing the Q values under mu A given S, where mu is selected to maximize it. So it explicitly finds these peaks and pushes them down. And this is more than just a rough heuristic. It turns out that if we do this, we can actually prove that the Q function we learn in this way, uh, Q hat pi, will lower bound the true Q function for the policy pi if we choose a large enough multiplier alpha. Uh, so this immediately leads to a effective algorithm, learn Q hat uh, pi for the current pi, such that it's a lower bound, and then update pi uh, to maximize its lower bound. And we call this algorithm conservative Q learning. We can slightly modify it to get a much better bound that works much more effectively in practice. If we don't just have this term that always pushes down on Q values, but we add an additional term that pushes up on the Q values in the data. This might seem a little strange at first because we're trying to avoid overestimation and we're like, pushing up on Q values. But the reason this makes sense is that if all of the high Q values are close to the data, then the first term and the second term will balance out because mu will look very similar to d. If the high Q values are far from the data, we'll minimize those high Q values and push up on the Q values under the data so the large Q values will move closer to the data and these things will put back into balance. So these terms actually do balance out in the end and you still end up avoiding overestimation. Now you're no longer guaranteed to lower bound the true Q function for all actions, but you are guaranteed to lower bound the expected value of Q on all states in expectation over the policy. And that's actually all you need because all you really need to do is lower bound the value of your uh, policy. But it ends up being a much tighter bound. So how does uh, CQL work? Well, so these are the results from the original CQL paper, which is now about a year old. Um, and this is testing some of the harder D4RL environments like ant mazes where uh, you know, uh, at the time there were basically no effective algorithms that could solve them and the strongest baseline on many other tasks was just behavior cloning. Um, CQL attained state-of-the-art results across all these tasks, including tasks that basically could not be solved any other way, and also on Atari games it uh, attained very large improvement. So it works quite well across many tasks, and we seem to know why it works because of this lower bound property. Now, of course, at the time uh, that we did this work, there was plenty of room for improvement. Lots of updated methods have come out in the last 15 months, and we've seen enormous growth in offline RL, but CQL is actually pretty widely used and has been approved consistently in more recent papers. So I'll just mention a few examples. So this is a paper that studies some methodological problems in offline RL evaluation, and they show that uh, this is fairly recent, that CQL is one of the best methods in these more stochastic environments that they test. In fact, they say the experimental results demonstrate uh, that these compared offline RL algorithms fail to outperform either the simplest behavior cloning method or the deterministic behavior policy, only except CQL. Uh, this is another paper, just to give one more example, that improves CQL with data augmentation. Again, shows that with appropriate data augmentation, CQL is even better uh, and beats alternative methods. So the approach is heavily in use and seems to be getting better and better, which is a good sign for reproducibility and things like that. But let's come back to the main topic of this talk, which is self-supervised learning. And let's discuss how we can use some of these offline RL methods to make that happen. So this is going to be more of a case study. Uh, but before I get into that, I do want to summarize some of the uh, theoretical and conceptual foundations. So in uh, standard RL, we have an agent that interacts with the environment and learns from reward. In self-supervised RL, we're going to need to take out the reward. So what do we use in place of rewards? Well, the idea is that S, uh, every state can itself be a different task. So we can generate these tasks automatically without any human guidance. So we're going to learn some Q function that takes in a state and action and a goal, which could be a goal state. It actually doesn't have to be a goal state. It could be something else, but it's perhaps simplest to think of it as a goal state. And we're going to learn it with some reward, R of S comma G, but this reward will be very, very simple and generated automatically. So G is some kind of task variable, which could be a state or it could be a latent variable. Um, and a very simple choice if G is a state is just a delta function. So it's just one if S is equal to G and zero otherwise. This is a very sparse reward task, and you have to be kind of creative to do this appropriately, but it's quite possible. You could also uh, learn a latent variable representation and then represent your reward as log P of G given S. So if uh, G is some latent variable, like a VAE latent variable, this can also work really well. Uh, you can do things more that are more sophisticated, like actually learning representations with the same mutual information objective that you use for RL, and that can give you even better latent representations. 
Now, this is not really a theory talk, so I'm not gonna go into great depth as to why this is a good self-supervised learning objective, but just to give you a little bit of a preview, you could imagine that um, we have the, we can formulate a mutual information objective, maximize mutual information between some future state and G, given your current state S. And there's actually a very good reason to believe that this is a good way to do self-supervised RL, and it turns out to actually reduce to goal-conditioned reinforcement learning if the representation of G is a goal state. So what this mutual information objective is saying is act in such a way that future states correlate with commanded goals. And the intuition is that this is a good idea because it forces you to learn how to produce any desired outcome. Formally, this is actually provably optimal pre-training to prepare for the worst case downstream task within some class. And the class is determined by your representation of G. So if G is all possible states, then this is the best thing to do to pre-train for, for the worst case downstream goal. If G is some latent task representation, this prepares you for the worst case downstream task from that set of tasks. Uh, I won't have time to go into the details of this, but if you wanna learn more about this, check out the paper Unsupervised Meta Learning for Reinforcement Learning by Gupta et al. Now, what does this have to do with uh, goal-conditioned RL? Well, if G is a representation of goals, uh, then once you write the mutual information in terms of H of G minus H of G given S, now we can see that to maximize mutual information, we have to perform diverse tasks, meaning propose all possible goals, which we can do just by sampling the goals uniformly. And we have to actually reach those goals so that the conditional entropy of the goal given the state we reached uh, is uh, very low. And I apologize, there's a typo, that should be H of G given S future. So the state that you actually reach G should correlate strongly, uh, sorry, the state that you reach S future should correlate strongly with the goal of G that was commanded. And to learn more about this, you can check out this paper by Pong et al called SKUFIT, State Covering Self-Supervised Reinforcement Learning, uh, which uh, illustrates this connection and explains how you get goal-conditioned RL to come out of it. Uh, as well as this paper called Diversity is All You Need by Eisenbach et al. that uses a latent variable uh, representation of this idea. Okay, but uh, to present the main case study that I wanted to talk about in this talk, um, this is an experiment uh, that uh, kind of started about three years ago at Google. We were initially interested in learning policies for a very specific task, robotic grasping, rather than doing self-supervised learning. So we collected a large data set of robotic interaction uh, by having these robots practice grasping in parallel. Uh, and then more recently, we extended this to a multitask setting. So far, nothing here is self-supervised. This is just, I'm basically just describing the data collection. So we defined 12 different tasks with manually designed essentially success detector classifiers, learned all these tasks, and we had this very large data set of robotic behavior. And then once we had done that, we thought, well, hey, what if we try to use this for self-supervised reinforcement learning? And crucially, the self-supervised experiment that we did did not collect any new data. So I, I, I mentioned these two papers, QTOP and MTOP. These were not self-supervised experiments. These were single task and multitask RL experiments. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the data from these experiments that we just have lying around and use it for self-supervised RL. And this is a project called Actionable Models uh, led by Yevgen Chebotar that was actually presented at this ICML conference the, this past week. So the setup is very much like uh, in the motivation from before, we're going to train a large Q function represented by a high capacity uh, convolutional network that takes in the current image and an image of the goal. And there's no reward function at all. The task is defined entirely in terms of the goal image. And uh, the robot is going to be attempting to reach that goal. So the reward is just one if you reach the goal and zero otherwise. And this uses conservative offline RL based on conservative Q learning. There's actually an extension on, on conservative Q learning that's used in this paper, but the principles are very similar. Uh, and it used the same data as these previous experiments. So no new data was collected for this project. It really is this offline self-supervised exercise. Now the method does work in the sense that the goal condition policy that you get is actually very effective at achieving goals. So if you show it a picture of an outcome that you want, like for example, a picture of a robot holding a carrot, uh, this self-supervised goal condition policy will reach that goal image. It'll actually move the robot so that the outcome matches the desired goal. So that's great. Um, but of course, in order for this to work, you need to actually produce those goal images. The main point I want to make in this talk is actually how this can be utilized for downstream tasks. So of course, it can be utilized to get this universal policy that does things like figure out how to drop carrots on plates, but it can also be used to facilitate downstream learning. 
Um, so if this works basically exactly as you would expect, train a goal condition Q function with offline RL, and then you could fine tune it with task reward data um, for some downstream tasks. We actually do something a little different. Uh, we actually implement uh, joint training. So we found that it's a little bit better if you have two heads, uh, a goal condition head with offline RL, and at the same time, uh, the task specific head. So you keep running the goal condition data through the model. Um, and that actually works quite well. So this is an experiment where we have a held out task, either bottle grasping or banana grasping. And the blue curve shows what happens with the actionable model's objective, with the self-supervised objective. And the yellow one shows what happens if you learn that task uh, from scratch. And you can see that it is learned to, to higher proficiency and much more efficiently if utilizing the self-supervised uh, representation. So what are the takeaways? Well, self-supervised reinforcement learning can be accomplished via goal-conditioned or other task-conditioned objectives, and we can train with such object objectives using offline data collected from other sources with other policies. And we can do this at scale, from images, in the real world, directly with real data, and with no simulation. When scaled up, this really works. You get a policy that can learn to reach diverse goals, and when used as auxiliary self-supervised objectives, such methods significantly improve performance and learning speed on downstream tasks. Now, of course, these are still RL tasks. It remains to be seen as to whether this is an effective self-supervised learning approach for any other downstream task. So that's, of course, for future work. Uh, but the initial signs of life are very promising. Uh, the last section of this talk, which I'll go through pretty quickly, uh, I, I want to talk about something a little more speculative. I want to talk about a more sophisticated approach to online fine-tuning with self-supervised RL. Uh, in the case where you have the opportunity for more interaction. Um, so the question in this paper, this is called, what can I do here, learning new skills by imagining visual affordances by Alexander Hazatsky and Ashwin Nair. Uh, the question we're asking is what to do after offline pre-training. And we developed this method called VAL, visual affordance learning. So the problem statement is we're gonna leverage prior data to explore a new environment by proposing likely goals, adapting to the new environment, and then carrying out user-specified goals in zero shot. So uh, the setup is that we have our, our prior data set, just like before, we're gonna do offline training on that prior data set, and then we're gonna place the agent in a new environment that it's unfamiliar with. Eventually, it's going to get some goal in this environment, like for example, lifting up this shoe, but before it gets that goal, it has the opportunity to perform some unsupervised practicing to prepare for likely downstream tasks. And it turns out that we can use offline pre-training to prepare the agent to practice effectively in this new environment. So this is gonna be a slight twist on the recipe that I had before. We have our offline data set, which has lots of different behaviors. We're gonna learn a goal condition policy, but we'll also learn an affordance model that helps us explore in this new environment. And then when we're placed in the new environment before we're given the human supervision, we do some self-supervised exploration in the target domain, and then we perform uh, the user-provided task in zero shot. So, if we place the robot in this environment with this shoe that it's never seen before, and we give it some task, it'll succeed maybe one time out of eight, so it'll perform pretty poorly. But if instead it's first given the opportunity to do some self-supervised training, where it actually hallucinates potential tasks that's shown in the lower right, attempts to perform them and fine-tunes its policy, then when it's given the user-specified goal, it gets a much higher success rate. So the idea is that we're going to use our prior data to learn both skills and affordances. So we'll actually learn a goal condition policy like before, but we'll also learn a generative model over possible goals. So this is a conditional generative model that takes in the current image the robot sees and predicts possible outcomes. So here the current image has a pot and a lid, and these pictures on the right, these are not real images. These are actually generated by the affordance model. These are images of what the robot thinks could be done in this environment. So it thinks, well, maybe I can put the uh, lid on the pot, or maybe I can grasp the lid. And then, uh, pr by proposing these goals, the robot can practice them in this new environment. So the intuition is that it's easier for the agent to imagine what could be done than to figure out how to do it. But if it can imagine what could be done, it can attempt to do it and refine its policy so that it can actually bring about any of those outcomes in the target environment. So here, uh, for instance, we took this uh, pot lid. The robot has seen pots and lids before, but we attached this funny object to the lid that was unfamiliar to the robot. If we just tell it to put the lid on the pot, it has a fairly low success rate. But if we allow it to do some unsupervised practicing in this environment first, it kind of imagines that maybe the lid can go on the pot, tries it a few times and gets a lot better at it. And then after doing that, uh, we can give it the goal of putting the lid on the pot and actually performs it with a much higher success rate. 
Similarly here, uh, if we have the robot uh, placed in an environment with a drawer that has some funny handle that it's never seen before, it doesn't know how to operate this handle, but it does know that drawers can be closed, so it starts imagining potential outcomes where the drawer is closed, practicing them, and getting better and better at manipulating this drawer so that when the user does give it a goal, it actually succeeds pretty consistently. And across the board, when we provide this uh, pre-training, uh, this uh, online fine-tuning phase without supervision, the robot's performance on downstream tasks increases substantially. So that's the middle column labeled down. So the takeaway is unsupervised learning or density estimation can be used to propose goals for self-supervised reinforcement learning in new settings. Um, and this gives us an interesting recipe for zero-shot generalization. Put the robot in a new domain, automatically propose goals via the affordance model, master the new domain, and then do anything the user asks for in zero-shot. So offline RL helps us learn, learn how to attempt goals and how to practice. Online RL allows us to quickly master a new domain. All right, so what else is there uh, to this problem besides the things I covered so far? Well, I didn't go into as much detail about algorithms uh, and improvements for offline RL, so I discussed CQL, but there are other algorithms that are actually optimized for pre-training followed by fine-tuning. So AWAKE, uh, cited here, is actually the algorithm we used in the VAL paper. Uh, there are methods and theory for self-supervised RL, which I alluded to, but I didn't cover in great detail. So if you want to learn more about this, check out these two citations. Uh, there are meta-learning and learning to explore algorithms like Perl and Parrot uh, that can uh, do more in terms of using prior data to learn how to explore efficiently. Uh, and then, of course, there's data sets, right? So to, to make all this possible, we need uh, large and diverse data sets we can use for pre-training with offline RL. Uh, and uh, We've done a little bit of work in that direction, so we collected a data set called RoboNet that's kind of designed for this, but I think a lot more work there is needed as well. So where do we go from here? Well, first, I think these ideas are really not just about robotics. I think self-supervised offline RL can be applied to any domain where we need machine learning to make decisions. And while all of the experiments I presented are really situated in a robotic setting, they don't necessarily have to be. Uh, so any domain where we need machine learning could likely benefit from this. There are still lots of missing pieces to figure out, uh, what is the right self-supervised RL objective? Should it be goal conditioning? Should we have latent goal representations? What is the best offline RL method? What should we transfer downstream tasks? Should we transfer features, skills? Should we try to generalize in zero shot or in few shot or transfer something else entirely? And how do we utilize data from a variety of sources? Maybe data that doesn't have actions, videos of humans and things like that. But if we can figure out these questions, I think we can develop powerful and principled self-supervised learning methods that will prepare our learning models for precisely the thing we need them to do most, make intelligent, adaptable decisions in the real world. Um, I'd like to thank the students that were involved in this work, and I'd like to thank you for listening.